First of all, I'd like to welcome you to this uh, Mark's Walk. Uh, as you can see, it's quite a nice day. It rains the blue sky as well as the dry weather. And um, basically, we're going to walk in Mark's footsteps. Uh, for, because for many years, after he was exiled from Europe, uh, in fact, his final period when he wrote Capital and all the main writings was in London. Marx was born on the 5th of May, 1818, in, in Thiers, in uh, Germany, and uh, died in London on the 14th of March, 1883. So perhaps if you maths are any good, you'll find out the next the few weeks' time we'll have the 130th anniversary of the death of Marx. It was quite an appropriate time for us to uh, carry out this uh, walk and an explanation a bit about his life and uh, his whereabouts because we will go to a number of places where he uh, lived, where he studied, where he wrote and also where he had a drink or two. <laughs> so you'll appreciate that. Um, Marx himself uh, clearly made a massive impact on history. We say he changed the course of history. In fact, uh, he hasn't stopped changing the course of history, as we'll find out in the next period. But uh, clearly, Marx is more relevant now than at any other time. Um, we have the worst crisis of capitalism since the 1930s, and many may say even deeper than the 30s in relation to its scope. And therefore, the ideas of uh, Marxism, the ideas of Marx, who analyzed uh, capitalism in a very in-depth fashion, are more relevant. In fact, even some of the strategists of capital and uh, even bourgeois newspapers have referred to Marx's role grudgingly. Um, I think one was in uh, October 1997. It was uh, an article appeared in the New Yorker uh, by the economic correspondent of the New Yorker who interviewed an investment banker um, from London who was working in uh, New York and uh, the interview went uh, well, what do you think and he said well the more I work in Wall Street the more I come to the conclusion that Karl Marx was correct I think that uh, the readers of uh, the New Yorker were a bit uh, worried by this, but nevertheless, it's been an indication how things were moving. Even in 1999, the BBC had uh, a poll. Uh, who was considered, who would you, you consider uh, the person who made such a big, the biggest impact in the last millennium? And top of the poll was Karl Marx. Again, an indication, a sign of the times, that's well before the economic crisis started to uh, hit. So obviously the, the relevance of Marx has become more and more the case and um, it's quite fitting for us to go and retrace some of the steps in London that he had. He, um, it was in 1844 that he met up with Engels and from that time on um, cemented a, a lifetime friendship with Engels, uh, a co-partner, co-worker and if you talk about Marxism, really it's the ideas not only of Marx, but also of Engels. Uh, Engels himself had come from a, a well-off background. In fact, his father uh, owned uh, textile mills in Manchester. And uh, Engels used to come over to London. In fact, in 1845, he brought Marx over to London. And um, on the basis of his visits, he wrote an important book called um, the conditions of the, of the working class in England in 1844, which became a classic because of the rich material about the exist what had happened the times of the workers in those conditions at that moment. Um, obviously, their ideas developed. Marx himself didn't begin as a communist. He began his ideas really as a revolutionary democrat. Um, he studied law at university, became very um, influenced by philosophy and above all German philosophy in the form of uh, Hegel's works. Hegel himself had been affected by the French Revolution and uh, conducted really a, a revolution in, in, in philosophy. 
an outlook. Although Hegel's ideas were a idealist, he believed that the um, material world was a reflection of some absolute idea. And um, first of all, starting with Feuerbach, and then Marx and Engels criticized Hegel from a materialist point of view, stood Hegel on, his, on the back on his feet, if you like. And um, the ideas of dialectics, of constant process of change in society, um, Marx gave a, a materialist expression to and became histor uh, well, historical materialism and dialectical materialism. Um, so more and more on the basis of his experience became challenging capitalism and came, became open to the ideas of communism, which they developed on a materialist foundation. In fact, one of the earliest writings was in 1844, called The German Ideology, where Marx and Engels collaborated on a book it was never published in their lifetime, but it was 800 pages, I think. Uh, you know, he said, well, the good thing about it, it helped me clarify my ideas. And uh, but even at that time, they were looking to do things. Marx became a journalist, an editor, and because of his writings, uh, fell foul of the authorities, which either closed down the newspapers or even exiled them. And um, he, he was pushed into exile into Belgium, where together with Frederick Engels, they organized the Communist Correspondence Society. And within a short time, they were, they were persuaded to join an organization called the League of the Just, which had headquarters also in London. And uh, the leaders of this organization, uh, some somewhat confused ideas, wanted to change society, but were very impressed by the writings of Marx and Engels. And uh, they're the ones who convinced them to join their organization. And within the space of a few months, the name of the organization changed from the League of the Just to the Communist League, which obviously was more in, in tune with, with uh, their aims and objectives. Engels came to London in the summer of 1847 and attended the first conference of the Communist League. Marx couldn't come, but it was only a preparatory conference for another one to be held in uh, December, end of November, beginning of December of 1847, where Marx and Engels attended in London, and we'll go to that particular uh, venue uh, shortly, where the Communist Manifesto was agreed to be written by these two young uh, revolutionaries. Um, of course, uh, when the Manifesto was published, um, a few months into 1848, revolution swept the whole of Europe. Not necessarily because of the manifesto, but nevertheless, um, monarchies collapsed, revolutionary movements uh, occurred, the working class, the embryonic working class moved into action, but the revolution in, in Europe was, was basically let down by the liberal democrats who put, came to the head of the movement. And um, as a result of the defeat of the revolution, and the, basically the uh, fear of Marx's ideas and the response he was getting, he was pushed from country to country, from Germany, from uh, uh, Belgium, uh, to France, from France to, to London. And he arrived in London in, uh, at the end of August, 1849. And that was the beginning of his, his lifelong exile, which lasted until his uh, death. He first of all went to uh, Chelsea, which is a very bourgeois area at the present time. Uh, when he got a, a place in uh, Anderson Street, uh, his wife joined him quite uh, soon afterwards. She was heavily pregnant, Jenny, and they had three children. And the fourth child was born uh, in November 1849, on the 5th of November, Guy Fawkes Night. And he was called, uh, nicknamed by uh, Marx, then Guido after, after um, uh, Guy Fawkes. Um, he was, uh, they went to uh, uh, Chelsea, Anderson Street, and they lived there for a, a few months, really. Three, four, five months. Uh, after which they were um, evicted for non-payment of rent. You find this is a, a long running saga of poverty, of squalor, of being evicted, of persecution in these early years of Marx's life in London. And from then he was, we went to the place called the German Hotel, which we will see, and from then he went to Dean Street, a 
again, which we will see. And the reason why I mention this is that Dean Street is only 10 minutes walk from the British Museum. And the British Museum was a very, very important place for Marx, particularly the reading room in the British Museum, because the enormous resources that were there, which he called upon in order to further write his books, articles, and so on, develop his ideas. Uh, I will leave it at that point because our first port of, call, port of call will be along the road there to the British Museum, which I'll give a bit more background detail <laughs> on what happened there and uh, what Marx wrote about and so on and so forth. So if you bear with us, we've got a 10 minute walk down to the British Museum. <laughs> Okay, this is our first port of call, the British Museum. As you can see by the architecture, the splendor of the architecture, it represents really uh, the uh, feelings of British imperialism, I would say. Uh, particularly when Marx came to London, uh, it was just a few years before the Great Exhibition of 1851, which again epitomized the uh, might of British imperialism. London itself was the metropolis of the empire. It was the biggest city in the world, two and a half million population, and it attracted, in the case of Marx, other refugees also came to London in their droves, and it was a hive of activity, political activity. Britain itself escaped a revolution in 1848, although prior to that it was shaken by a movement of the working class in the form of Chartism. The Chartist movement was the first working class party in history. And the Charter itself, although six points of the Charter, was seen by Engels as a means to an end. In other words, it was a way forward for the working class in Britain to come to power. And uh, Chartism went through a, uh, quite a considerable evolution in this period of 10 years, not only uh, signing petitions, but also mass meetings and mass rallies. Uh, the latest one were, uh, at that time was in 1848 in Kennington in South London, where 100,000 gathered to hear the Chartist uh, leaders. Uh, they also staged uh, an insurrection in Newport in South Wales and uh, was in favour of a general strike in 1842. So we went through a whole gamut of experiences, uh, which was very important. And as I said, it was the first awakening, if you like, of the British working class, together with the formation of, uh, of the trade union movement. Of Rod Rod Owen, of Owenism became an, an important trend in the British labour movement. And uh, Marx came to London in this kind of ferment. Although after the defeat of the 1848 revolution, you can imagine there was a certain demoralization that the Communist League was in exile. And uh, those groups in exile always found it difficult to integrate themselves and would fall out. And within a few years, the Communist League had collapsed. But uh, Marx had moved to uh, Dean Street, which is 10 minutes away from here. And every single day, he used to come to the British Museum to the reading room in order to uh, well delve into the rich resources that existed here. In 1842 there was an act of parliament which said that every single newspaper, every periodical, every book, every publication had to have a deposit in this building and therefore that was the, the richest resources in the world were here and that allowed Marx to explore different questions and write the books he was able to write, particularly in relation to his later works of capital, which he mainly got the resources from here. So this is an important, I would say, a key place for the development of Marxism intellectually in its theoretical aspects. And uh, as you can imagine, Marx coming here, come rain, shine, mostly rain in the fog, coming here day in and day out to carry out his researches. And then he's to go home, the, uh, first of all, 
There was only one library here, which we'll, let, we'll look at. There's also a second library, the big reading room, the big glass dome reading room. But it had no lighting, only natural lighting, which meant that in the winter, you could only read books up until about four o'clock. Uh, afterwards, Marx went home and continued his studies in the house. And he also wrote up his notes from being here. And sometimes he would stay up all night till three, four, five o'clock in the morning, writing these notes. And that so shows the uh, kind of powerhouse, if you like, of, of uh, Marx, his dedication to uh, finding and exploring the main ideas of the time and developing them into a, a rich um, analysis and outlook, as we know as scientific socialism or Marxism. Anyway, let's uh, go into the great building and see the, the, the reading room. Unfortunately, they've now turned it into an exhibition area before you could actually see the library. The box itself have been removed, taken to the new British Library down the road. So inside, it's still there, rows of uh, chairs and tables which were originally set out. You can also see Marx's chair in the desk he wrote at. Look at the, the, the number is 07. Want to have a better explanation? Um, this is where he came, uh, spent all his last years. This is where he writes the Grandrisa. After, after the crisis of 1857, he gathers all the notes and he writes and writes. The Grand Theater is about uh, a thousand words, a thousand pages rather, in, in, uh, in size. That is the, the preliminary writings for Marx's capital. Uh, there's a whole series of other writings he uh, undertakes here in the early 60s, early 1860s, and finally in 18. 67, he managed to finish the first volume of Capital and is then published. The manuscripts for volume 2 and volume 3 and the theories of surplus value have also been written by this time. And again, it's this place where he, he manages to write all those, uh, those works. So this is really a, a place where he analyzes capitalism in its detail works out all the main theories and contradictions of capitalism in this year. He draws on all the writings of the main classical bourgeois economists, uh, David Ricardo for instance, but also he takes advantage of the government blue books, which are records of, um, or details of records of factory inspectorates. So he gets all this raw material, which you'll find in volume one of Capital, directly under the chapter called The Working Day. All this stuff is assembled, goes through it all, and this is where the Capital is really created. So this is a very important part of Marx's life. Again, day in and day out. There's hardly a day goes by he doesn't come here apart from other activities he was involved in. After, after 1864, he was helping the building of the first international. And we will go to the offices of the first international uh, today as well. But uh, not only was he involved in, in other words, the day-to-day -day movement of the working class, but also he was working to develop the theoretical armory for the working class as well. Now this, as I said, was, was built and finished in 1856-57. Prior to that, from 1850, when Marx first came here, to 1856, he studied in, this, in the old library, which is a, a room just inside this particular building here. And we can go to it now. This is the original um, main building of the museum. Well, obviously it goes back that way as well, lots of building. But this was the library, the old library. And it was in here that Marx did much of his writings 
from 1850 to 1856. One of the first writings was his address of the Central Committee to the Communist League, which ends with the famous quote, uh, we need a, a slogan, the slogan of permanent revolution. So it was in that article here they came up with the idea of permanent revolution. Um, other writings that he wrote here was the uh, writing on the 18th Brumaire of Louis Bonaparte, again was uh, written here, and a number of other articles as well, important articles, a number of them from in this particular period. Uh, clearly, again, this is where Marx was able to access the key writings of other, other theorists, of the historians, other economists. And on that basis, this was this provided him with the ammunition, if you like, in order to um, prepare the movement, the Marxist movement for the coming period. This, this is the time, 1850, 1856, where I think when Marx was most in poverty, most oppressed by life, um, was, well, what, lived in Dane Dean Street, which will go, which three of his children died because of um, uh, poverty, because of the conditions they lived under. So for basically 20 years, Mar uh, Engels worked in Manchester in order to get money, in order to keep Marx and uh, his family in body and soul. And if it wasn't for Engels, the Marx certainly wouldn't have survived. That's quite clear. So it was a very important um, collaboration between both individuals. Okay, the next port of call, literally a port of call, is um, a White Hart Inn, which is a pub, uh, which you'll be allowed to consume a little bit of alcohol in order to uh, further you on the way. You'll be the step a little bit quicker, hopefully. <laughs> so uh, anyway, that's only about five minutes away. So we'll go down here. And that was a body created in uh, London for German emigres, but also then it was expanded out to, to encompass different nationalities. French, Bulgarian, all sorts. So it was like for a cosmopolitan association. Um, and uh, that organization became the legal cover for the, for the activities of the Communist League. See, so they had a sort of, so they had to use this as a front, if you like, for their activities. Uh, here's the, was one of the main headquarters, the other one was in, uh, in Piccadilly, which we will see shortly. But uh, Marx actually came here, was invited to speak uh, in November 1847, and addressed a, uh, a meeting here, upstairs on the first floor. Uh, the building, the pub itself, you go in there, it's quite small, but it's an upstairs which I've never been there, but Lo and behold, I have uh, an account by uh, Wilhelm Liebknecht, who was a close friend of Karl Marx, and he was in London in 1850 and wrote an account of what this place was like and what happened there. So I'll read it to you just a bit of, as a bit of a flavour of, of the situation. On the ground floor was an ordinary grog shop. Grog shop is pub, public bar. Still there in which porter and other fine beer could be bought. The name porter was the classification of a very dark, like Guinness it was, dark bitter at that uh, time. It's no longer sold, unfortunately, but there we are. Um, uh, we went through an upper flight of stairs into a hall-like room, which could hold around 200 people on tables and benches distributed around the room. Some 20 sat in groups, ate a simple evening meal, or smoked out of one or other of their pipes lying on the table, their jug of grog before them. Others stood here and there, and every moment the door opened to let in a newcomer. So it was clear that the meeting 
would not begin for some time. Obviously, he was waiting for the meeting to start. Most faces one saw belonged to the working classes. Although all were decently dressed and in behavior were very easy, but throughout a dignified tone uh, reigned. The language of conversation was mainly German, although one could also hear English and French spoken. At one end of the hall stood a grand piano, which in unmusical London was the best proof to us that we had found the right room. We knew, what, we knew none of those present, so we sat down a little obviously across from the door at the bar and bought a glass of porter and here a, a obligatory penny packet of tobacco in order to wait our acquaintances, in order to wait for our acquaintance, Sapper, who invited us. He invited us to sit down with him at the end of the hall, showed me a piece of paper stuck on the wall on which the statutes of the association were written. So there we are, the, when you even went in there, you had the, the association statutes on the wall, so you should uh, be careful what to do. I looked at the association's library and bought some communist tracts. Well, that was a, an eyewitness account for 1850. And I said, a couple of years before, Marx addressed one of the main meetings of the Communist League, as it would have been, under the cover of the Communist Workers' Association at this particular place. Engels also spoke here, and no doubt also enjoyed a pint of porters as well. So we can go in here if you want a drink, by all means, We'll be here for about, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes. Right here, folks. Well, you can see the reason why we come here. There's a plaque up the, uh, on the wall there, Karl Marx. So lived here 18. Oh, nice to He lived here 1851, 1856. That's not true. They made a mistake. He lived there 1850, 1856. He moved in in uh, December. Um, oh, I got. Uh, first of all, I should say he moved here from a house further down the road in the same street. And uh, this is the time. These six years are probably the worst years of Marx's life, really. Uh, he's in desperate poverty. Uh, the only income that Marx has got is uh, writing articles for the New York uh, Tribune. And he's paid a pound per article. He tries to write two articles a week. Doesn't always succeed. And usually Engels gives him a hand to write the article. Um, but he's in real desperate straits. Uh, Basically, he lives, I'll tell you, it's the, the top floor, the very top floor. And he got two rooms, one in the front and one in the back. And that's it. And there's uh, Marx, Marx's wife, well, Jenny. And there are um, children. Well, in, in, in 1855, there are five children. Um, sorry, four children. And also his... Um, uh, house, housemaid, housekeeper, also stays there as well. So all he sleep in the back bedroom. Imagine all piling the back bedroom, and this front bedroom, uh, this front window open here, is his uh, basically his lounge, his study, and everything else. It was very, very cramped, to say the least. Uh, he hasn't got very much money, um, and therefore. Week in and week out, his debtors are knocking at the door all the time. He owes for, you know, he owes the, for the bakery, he owes the, the milkman, he owes the, the, the butcher, he owes everybody. And they're all trying to get money out of him. Uh, and he's uh, giving him a little bit at a time just to keep him off his back. Um, at one stage, he says that uh, he's, tried, he's feeding the family on potatoes and bread. And that's all, that's all. Because he's got no money to buy any, any meat or anything. Um, this is the street in which three of his children then die. Um, so it shows how, how and this is from poverty-related diseases, really. Um, so, so you can see the, the absolute 
of the squalor, if you like, that Marx is living in at the present time. Um, he pawns his stuff, because the pawnbroker would pawn his coat for, for money and so on. And that was a regular feature of his existence in this particular street. That didn't deter him from going every day to the British Museum from here. And then coming back and writing, uh, writing up his uh, notes in the front room, as you can see up there. And uh, he did, did this for these, this long, painful six years of his life. Um, got here a few notes. His landlord was an Italian cook called John Marengo. That might interest you, but uh, I've seen a photograph with this. It's, uh, it's uh, a laundry as well. This becomes a laundry. So at, at the moment, it's a very posh uh, Italian restaurant. But uh, it was a laundry for, for many years, so it was a very, in this area, it was very down and out, you know. So you are lucky not uh, at, the, at the London it is today, but very much a London of the, the poorer working classes, immigrants, um, all, all the ills that went with it. So uh, this is the kind of this depressing state that uh, he's in. He manages also because um, Jenny is from a, an upper middle, upper class from the aristocracy actually, Jenny von Westphalen. Her uncle, I believe, is a member of the government in Germany. So that's how it shows how far the, uh, the family tree goes. But she's dedicated to, to Marx and his ideas. She's, she's also, you know, a, a communist. And um, they try and uh, make ends meet by doing all sorts to also try to, uh, to get some family inheritance if they can. Occasionally some people die in the family and they get a little bit of uh, inheritance which keeps them going a little while. But the whole thing is uh, hand-to-mouth existence, really. And uh, this is the, the only other sustaining factor, as I explained earlier, is Frederick Engels. If you read the correspondence between Frederick Engels and Marx, it's invariably, please send me money. Please send me a fiver, please send me a tenner. I can't exist, this is the, the bills are, and... and you know, Engels generously send, sends in this money as regularly as he possibly can. So it keeps uh, the family uh, their head above water a little bit, for want of a better expression. Even when, uh, I think he was saying, when Henry uh, died, they didn't have uh, they didn't have enough money for the coffin. And I think he had, he had to uh, pawn a coat or something to get money for a coffin in order to bury his, uh, his child. The three of them are buried uh, in the tabernacle grounds not so far from here. If you get a chance later on, I might take you around there. It's, it's, you can't see the, 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 the graveyard. The graveyard has been paved over, basically. There are a few gravestones, none of which indicate Marx's uh, uh, sons and daughter. But nevertheless, that's where they were um, laid to rest. In fact, it was, there's one story where Marx is so distraught about uh, the death of his child he goes to the funeral and he, even in the point of throwing himself in, he reckoned, uh, he was sort of pulled, pulled back. He was so emotional about the whole episode. Um, his wife, in particular, uh, carried a lot of uh, the brunt of this existence, you know. And uh, so it was a very sorry state of affairs. And yet, despite all that, he for forged, if you like, this, these ideas, this, this cause to change the world to liberate the working class and uh, shows the, uh, the way in which someone prepared to sacrifice everything. His health, his, his, his future, he could have been a professor at a university in, in uh, Germany or elsewhere. Uh, even the health of his family was sacrificed in order to fight this cause of the working class, the emancipation of, of the working class. Um, obviously people used to come and visit uh, Marx and emigrants and so on would visit him. But also you had the occasional uh, police spy would come along and uh, pretend to be a, a sympathiser and, and would see him and, and, and do a report. And we got one of the police reports here which I will read out to you. Uh, as father and husband, Marx, in spite of his wild and restless character, is the gentlest and mildest of men. Marx lives in one of the worst, 
therefore one of the cheapest quarters of London. Sure. <laughs> he occupies two rooms. The one looking out on the street is a parlour and the bedroom is in the back. In the whole apartment, there's not one clean and solid piece of furniture. Mark's room is full of tobacco fumes that makes your eyes water when you go in. Like a fog, he says. Everything is dirty and covered with dust. Here is a chair with only three legs on it. Another, the children are playing at cooking. And he says, I haven't got it here, but he says, you dare not go on that chair because it's full of all this children's cooking stuff, you ruin your, you ruin your pants. But it shows the, the squalor, if you like, that they, they were living in, the desperate circumstances. In fact, uh, Marx was to say, I think a year later, in, in writing uh, at the Gundrisa notes, said, well, there's someone who writes a lot about money and doesn't have a penny. This is a, an irony of ironies. Right about capitalism, and yet isn't it in the uh, throes of poverty itself? Okay, then, well, uh, what we can do, we can head over, cross over, and we'll go to Greek Street, which is the, was the headquarters of the First International. Okay, then. <laughs> Number 18, Greek Street. It's the headquarters of the First International, the International Working Men's Association, which was established in October 1864. The General Council met here every week, every Tuesday, 8 o'clock, and uh, met here until January 1866. Uh, this was a very important uh, turning point in the history of the working class internationally. Uh, there, there was a conference that took place in uh, St. Martin's Hall, Long Acre, Acre Lane in London, uh, in September of that year. They decided to organize an international body of the working class. Marx himself threw himself into, basically, uh, this work of building the international. So it's extremely important, despite the fact that at that time he was uh, deeply involved in writing Capital, uh, he saw that this urgent need to be involved in the workers' movement over here. And the uh, minutes of this meeting, of well, these meetings is in my hand here, documents of the first international, 1864-1866 because the entire period that they're at this particular offices. Um, interesting to quote, uh, the, first, the first, first meeting ever held here, the first meeting of the committee, that's the General Council, elected by the public meeting held at St. Martin's Hall on the 20th of September, 1864, was held at 18 Greek Street, Soho, on October the 5th, uh, 1864, and on the motion of Mr. Weston, and seconded by Mr. Whitlock, and Mr. G. Uh, Odger, was voted into the chair. The chairman said the first business was the appointment of a secretary to the committee when Dr. Marx proposed that Mr. Whitlock seconded that Mr. Kremer be appointed. Mr. Kremer would prefer the appointment of Mr. Le Lubex, who was believed in any way more qualified. Mr. Bu uh, Lubex, having for various reasons declined the offer, Mr. Kremer was unanimously elected. The next question discussed was the meeting nights of the committee, when several re resolutions and amendments were proposed. But ultimately, on the motion of Mr. Longmaid, seconded by Mr. Dell, it was carried with one dissension that until the association is in working order, the committee meet at 18 Greek Street every Tuesday evening at 8 o'clock. The question being asked as to the expenses of the meeting room, that is the rent for the place, 
it was agreed to adjourn the consideration of the matter till the Council of the Universal uh, League had decided on what terms they would allow us to use the room. And it gives you a, a footnote saying that the Council of the Universal League owned this particular place. I could find it. Yes, the Universal League for the Welfare of the Industrial Classes, as it was called. Founded in London in December 1863. This was their headquarters, and uh, they're the ones who rented out the room to the International. It was very cheap rent, and they, they stayed here for about, as I said, two years. Karl Marx was elected as the corresponding secretary for the German organization and was duly appointed to the uh, General Council of the First International. This explains in these uh, minutes that they decided they would drop rules and they would drop uh, aims, if you like, of the International. And the people who started to draw it up, this bloke called George Weston, who was the supporter of Robert Owen, his draft was a bit of a mess, a bit confused, as uh, Mark said, a bit of a shambles, and he managed to delay the meeting, whereby Marx was able to draw up the uh, address and the rules, which I believe I have in the uh, in this book somewhere. Ah, oh, here it is. <laughs> uh, and, the, and the provisional rules of the association begins with the famous quote that the emancipation of the working classes must be conquered by the working classes themselves. And that uh, sets the tone, if you like, of the preamble. And Marx spent the vast bulk of his uh, life, or rather this, this, this active part of his life, in helping to build the international. The international moved away from here in 1866. But the biggest crisis for the international came after the defeat of the Paris Commune in 1871 where there was a general reaction. There was a problem from the anarchists who were involved in the First International. And eventually, apart from whether they were expelled, but the International was not just held together. All the people who had kind of come to it before, and in Britain, you had the British or English trade union leaders were part of the First International. They were, if you like, reformist leaders. But they saw the International as a means of preventing uh, uh, where strikes could be won by preventing blacklegging from people abroad. So they adhered to the First International. They were Prudenists, they were Lasallians, they were all a number of other political trends came together in the First International. But Marx was able to put his imprint on it, give it theoretical guidance uh, because of his ability, his foresight. He was able to give it more coherence, if you like and guided throughout these particular years. But by 18, 1872, it became clear that the International was in difficulties, that they transferred the offices to New York, and in 1876, they de de declared that the International should be dissolved until better times, until they could preserve the, like the International, not let, it get be, not let it be run down and wrecked, but preserve it for the better, better conditions to emerge in Europe. And in 1889, you had the emergence of the Second International. It took place on the 14th of July, the 100th anniversary of the French Revolution. At the beginning, and this time, it wasn't a small little group in meeting in a little place like this. The Second International were mass parties of the working class, mass parties in Germany, in France, and other major European countries came together and Engels was to attend one of the last conferences of the Second International in 1890, where he spoke, and he could see that this was the making of the, the, the international organization of the working class. And the main thing to understand is, although the first international was under Marx's influence, there were a variety of other opinions and um, ideas expressed in the international. By the time of the Second International, it had become a wholly Marxist international, based on class struggle, Marxism, socialism, and world revolution. The story of the Second International is a different matter. We haven't got time to go into it now, but it degenerated, as, as perhaps you might know, led to the betrayal in 1914 and the emergence 
of the Third International, built by Leonard Trotsky in 1919. Again, this is not the appropriate time to discuss the, the histories of the International, but here is where it all began. So this is quite a, a prime spot, in my opinion, where Marx would have been coming in here every Tuesday to argue the case, to, 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 and they had lots of these, these supported disputes in Britain and in other countries. The whole minute book was full of how they developed the international, people joining the international, and it became quite a threat for the international bourgeoisie at that particular time. So here's the origins. Here's where Marx made his impact on those origins. Okay, any questions? No, there's one here. <laughs> no, in that case, we can... Yes, Mark. Sorry, Engels. Engels was in the second international, yeah. Not Marx, he was dead. Yes, that's right, Engels. Okay. Okay, then, now we can uh, go back in time. Well, I can't where we will go. Questions. Uh, in the yes. um, when they were talking about the second international, the second international, were they talking about better economic circumstances? No political circumstances. What the, what the Marx had done, if like had planted the seeds. Um, in Germany and elsewhere. And on the basis of events, the developing working class movement, because you never had any real mass working class parties before that, except you could say, and then even in Britain, Britain, the British Labour Party, which was born out of the trade unions, wasn't created till 1900. And it was the unions, the trade unions, who built the party. Whereas in Germany and on the continent, it was the other way about. The political parties came into existence and they built the trade union movement uh, in Germany and elsewhere. So yes, it was the, be the better political circumstances that emerged at that particular time. In fact, you had a... Yes, uh, I don't want to go into much more detail than, than that. Otherwise, you could be here all night. <laughs> all right. OK, we'll uh, march on. I'm sure Mark G. Shaw, I'll be taking the next minute and come down here. But he was given this. It's only just a few hundred yards up the road where Marx lived. And in 1850, Frederick Engels lived here. In Macclesfield Street. And uh, obviously that was very close to Marx, and that's where they visited a lot. That's quite a very, very uh, relative of Marx still living. No? Nobody knows? I think there is a relative. There is a relative, but... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Alright, here's another um, place that Mark stayed with his family in this building and this was called in 1850 it was called the German Hotel and it was a, basically a hotel for transients I think uh, is the way of putting it now um, this is the second place that Mark stayed while in London the first place he, st he stayed was in Chelsea in Anderson Street but he was evicted from there and uh, if I have it here, it should do. There's a, an account by Jenny Marx of the eviction in Anderson Street. It goes as follows. There were 200 or 300 persons loitering around the door. The whole Chelsea mob. The, bre the beds which had been put outside of the house, were brought back in again. They could not be delivered to the buyer until after sunrise the next day. When we had sold all our possessions, we were in a position to pay what we owed to the last farthing. A farthing is a quarter of a penny in old currency. 
I went with my little darlings to the two small rooms we are now occupying in the German hotel. Number one, Leicester Square. There, for five pounds a week, we were given a humane reception. Now, there are two rooms here. Five pounds a week was an enormous amount of money to stay. He managed to last out about six weeks, I think. Mainly because in Anderson St Street, where they'd been evicted, the rent was five pounds a month. So to find five pounds a week was impossible. Why didn't he stay in Anderson Street then? They evicted him, he didn't pay the rent. Well, but he couldn't afford five pounds a week. No, he didn't afford it. He went to stay there. I'll pay you tomorrow. I'll pay you next week. I'll pay you the week after, I presume. In other words, credit. But of course, credit ran out. And, it's, and uh, Jenny says, uh, not so long later, one morning, our host refused to serve us our breakfast and we were forced to look for other lodgings. So that, well, that was that in the German hotel. And the other lodgings was in 64 Dean Street, just around the corner where we just came from. So we didn't spend a lot of time here. Obviously it's all, it's very much a high class restaurant here. There was a front door here. They obviously put the windows in and they'd done it up. The whole shell is exactly the same. Obviously it catered for a lot of people. Obviously a lot of people who were transient populations coming in and going out. But nevertheless, this was the second place that Marx was able to get shelter, but just for a short period of time before it ended up in Dean Street. So this is uh, another place where there's no plaque for Marx. Uh, what was the plaques for? Johann Strauss. No doubt, very good, but there we are. There should be a mark, plaque there for Marx as well. So this is it. The German hotel, as it was. And as I said, the building is completely intact. There's no changes there on the outside, apart from the, they've, they've uh, put extra window in downstairs instead of the doorway. All right. Now, we'll go further back in time couple of months we'll go to Piccadilly, we'll go to the Red Lion pub as it was then, where Marx and Engels was asked to write the Communist Manifesto, which is about five minutes walk from here. And hopefully it's a bar, we'll see if it's open. <laughs> I'd like to say this is our final destination and it's quite uh, appropriate uh, because th this particular venue here, which used to be called the Red Lion, now changes its name to the Ed One, uh, nevertheless was the, the headquarters, another headquarters of the German Workers Association. And uh, on the first floor, um, on the 29th of November, to be precise, uh, 1847, uh, for one week until the 8th of December, it was the second conference of the Communist League, attended by Engels and by Marx. And after the week-long discussions about perspectives, developments, they were requested by the conference to draw up a manifesto that would encapsulate the perspectives they had discussed that particular week. And that uh, manifesto became known as the Communist Manifesto, which was written by Marx and Engels when they went back to Belgium for a period of weeks afterwards. Although it's true to say that the leadership of the Communist League in London were a bit, how can I say, impatient because uh, Marx and Engels had agreed to produce this document within a specific period of time and they failed to do it. So they were reprimanded by the leadership of the Communist League for this, uh, this, uh, yeah, this, this failure, this uh, declaration of duty and therefore uh, they were spurred on to make sure that they completed the task by February 
1848. So this place is a very historic uh, place. This is where the manifesto was born, which I don't know how many languages the manifesto has been translated into, but hundreds probably, I don't know, lots and lots of languages. <coughs> in English, the manifesto was published first in 1850 by a Chartist newspaper called the Red Republican. Although the translation was a little bit uh, off, if you like, a bit obscure. Instead of, instead of the, the spectre is haunting Europe, I think they said hobgoblins were haunting Europe. But nevertheless, <laughs> later on they got the translation right. Uh, in fact, just up the road there, not so far up the road there on the left hand side, was the editorial offices of the, the Northern Star which was the Chartist newspaper which Engels used to write for. So, kind of, and uh, was edited mainly by George Harney. And uh, that was the left wing of the Chartist movement. But uh, going back to this particular venue, it was used also by the German Workers' Association to have practically daily meetings. It, it put on various uh, events, not only political events, where on Mondays they would have uh, the French society would come because this association was made up of different nationalities. And each of those nationalities were, were asked to put on different events. And they would have lectures about politics, lectures on economics, lectures on geography. They would have singing, they would have dancing, they would have cultural events also put on by the German Workers' Association. Probably every single night of the week was taken up by such events. So it was a hive of enormous activity and a great cover for the, for the work of the Communist League itself that was being undertaken at that time. So this has certainly a big landmark, I would say, a real big landmark for Marxism. It was the birth, if you like, of the Communist Manifesto, the birth of real Marxism as it became known, scientific socialism. So. This is something we need to soak in, if you like, and uh, to take note of this uh, historic occasion that you are witnessing today, so long after the event. So this very place, this very spot, you know, it was a, a landmark in changing the whole of history itself. Uh, as I said, it was a, a pub. It's now not a pub. Well, it is a bit of a pub, is it? Or is it a bar, cocktail bar? But if you like to uh, participate for a drink, I know it's five o'clock, it's the end of the day, end of the day. I hope you've enjoyed it and uh, you've learned a little bit and uh, I've, I've, I've kept your interest for a while. And hopefully this will spur you on, not just to uh, note the landmarks that Marx and Engels lived, worked at and so on, but you will read, reread the works of Marx to show how relevant it is today and that these ideas are worth fighting for to change society. And if this is the birthplace of the Communist Manifesto, then it's a good place to say this, to fight for the change of society because it's more relevant now than ever before, more relevant than in 1848. And therefore, let's go with a, a hearty, stirring um, rendition, in my opinion, of the Internationale. All of us will know it. Arise, ye starlings from your slumber. Arise, ye criminals of God. For these are in revolt and love. And the dust and the 